Please be seated for the reading of the epistle of this day, the face of the most holy trinity. The epistle is that of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and of the knowledge of God. How incomprehensible are his judgments, and how unsearchable his ways. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who had first given to him, and recompense shall be made him. For of him, and by him, and in him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. These were the words of the gospel. Please, uh, epistle, please stand up for the Holy Gospel. <coughs> Taken from that of St. Matthew, chapter 28. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Going, therefore, teach ye all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. These were the words of the gospel. Please be seated. A few announcements today. Uh, so we have the new bulletin. Thank you. That has been uh, put out this morning, so for the month of June. So here in Langley, tomorrow mass at 8, Tuesday 7.15, uh, Wednesday 6 p.m., uh, Thursday, Feast of Corpus Christi will be 7.15 and 8 a.m. Uh, and then on Friday, 7.15, 6 p.m. And on Saturday, uh, I think there is a mistake here. So, uh, I don't have a pen with, oh yes, there is a pen here. So, Saturday it says 6 p.m., but obviously that is not right. So, it's going to be 9 a.m. as usual. So, when you read the bulletin, make sure that basically it's the same schedule as normal. Father is coming back tomorrow, so we're going to have the two Masses starting on Tuesday, so forth so on. You have it in the vestibule as well. Uh, there will be children catechism and apologetic class after Mass today. Those are very important. There will be a second collection today for the building fund. Uh, the kitchen fund is empty. Donations are welcome. Please see Kathy Berger after Mass. Thank you for your continued support. Yes, so, that's, so that you can have coffee and, and uh, muffins and uh, toasts after Mass. So, okay, another thing. Yes, so today we are going to talk a little bit about actuality, what is going on with the society. Um, you know, we had Father Wegner's letter a couple of weeks ago talking about different uh, letters he had received, uh, some who are afraid of an agreement, some who are for an agreement with Rome. And uh, so he summarized a little bit the different positions, but at the end basically he says uh, we have to 
uh, trust Bishop Philly and we have to try not to be uh, excited about all these things and worried and uh, have a fighting with each other. Uh, so um, that was two weeks ago. Um, but obviously the internet uh, is a kind of a system that doesn't stop because uh, a priest said so. There's, I don't know if there is any power apart from God who could stop the internet really. So I told you many times I hate the internet but sometimes there are things that you have to look up and uh, anyway so the internet uh, chatting and stuff has not stopped uh, the news on the internet, they have not stopped either. Uh, so, and many people still have uh, questions, what's going on, Father, and I receive all kind of emails and all that. So, um, what about these letters from the three, Bishop Williamson, Bishop Galaita, Bishop Tissier, um, in April, it's on the internet, uh, you know, they, they, they are against a practical agreement. Uh, what about the answer of Bishop Philly? It's on the internet too. What about the interview of Bishop Philly to the CNS, the Catholic News Service, which is a pre uh, news service from the U.S. bishops. Yeah. So they went to Mensingen. And uh, in this interview, he says that uh, he unfortunately kind of uh, cannot exclude the possibility that there could be a split in the society if uh, there is um, purely practical agreement with Rome. So what about that? Uh, what about those sermons that we see on the internet that we have? Uh, listened to or heard about Father Joe Pfeiffer, Father Shazal in Asia, who preached strongly against such an agreement, and now they have been uh, ordered not to talk anymore or preach. What about Father Rostam, who forbade them to say Mass in the society chapels in the United States and to preach in the United States when they come for vacation this summer. What about that, Father? What about that? We see this, we see that. There is problem. What about that list of priests who have been expelled from the society? Uh, Father, six were expelled. Uh, and five more are in danger of expulsion. So, for, so, Father, Father, what should we do? So, yes, those news are troubling. It is true. There is, and we cannot, we cannot uh, say the contrary, the reality uh, is that there is a crisis in the society. Should we, should, should, should we be surprised? There is even a bigger crisis in the Catholic Church. So, I mean, you know, so therefore it's normal that there is a crisis in the, the society. The society is composed of human beings. Everybody wants to do what's right, but they don't always have the same opinion about what's right and what's not right. Uh, in families, we have crisis too. So should, should we be scandalized about the fact that there are different opinions? No, it's just normal. So let's calm down. Let's calm down. We have all these news. I didn't tell you all the news. That's all I can remember for now. The internet is full of news. And I know that many of you uh, are much more skilled uh, than me. And I still don't like the internet, but sometimes if people send me stuff, uh, sometimes, sometimes uh, I will check. So I don't know everything. Uh, one thing I know is that there is a lot of fuss about 
an agreement with Rome. But one fact is that as of today, there is no agreement with Rome. Uh, nothing has been signed and we don't even know what that text would be. So, uh, why should we fuss? Why should we fight? You see what I mean? So, uh, we are about Father, okay, that's nice, that's like, what, basically what you say is the same thing that Father Wexner letter, yes, in a way, is true, because we need to keep calm, and we need to pray, make sacrifices, and not not fight, not fight with each other, because right as of now, there is nothing to fight about. There is no agreement. We don't know what this would be, so you know, what's the point? It's a more like a theory fight. If you don't have nothing concrete to discuss. Um, but what can we do? What can we do to best implement the, the line of the society today, uh, which is the same, uh, we, there was letters from the district superiors uh, that I've read from France, from uh, Germany, uh, United States, Canada, and Asia. And all the district superiors agree that uh, we should keep quiet trust Bishop Fillet and um, trust the Holy Providence of God and so forth so on. But, but other than that, what could we do to try to achieve this peace that our superiors uh, ask us to keep? Uh, so I decided that, well, uh, if there are some signs of division today, we should go back to the time when there was no such division. We should go back to the official doctrine of the society, which is still good today. Whatever you see on the internet, the official doctrine of the society uh, is summarized. It, well, you have it in many books. Uh, from Archbishop Lefebvre, they have uncrowned him, open letter to confused Catholics. Uh, I accuse the council, uh, very, very good books that we sell. Uh, but the best is here. The best that I know of, uh, summary of the society's doctrine is called the Catechism of the Crisis in the Church. So it was um, uh, written by Father Matthias Gaudron, a French. So sometimes they do something good. Uh, and uh, so f for a year or so, it was only in French. But, and, and here I have a commentary from His Excellency Bishop Feuille about this book. Uh, when it came out in French, he said, quote, I absolutely wish that this book is made available to the English-speaking countries. So his uh, wish, is, uh, that he absolutely wished, has been implemented a year later, and now you have it in good old plain English. And uh, I just received this catalog of the Angelus Press, and it is there, and you can order it, 1695, that's pretty good. And moreover, uh, I've been given this this morning, for this month of June, there is a special offer. If you purchase any item in the bookstore, uh, you will be entered in a draw to win a $25 gift certificate. The draw will be held on Sunday, July the 1st. I have already ordered a few copies uh, a week or 10 days ago. I asked Mrs. Filiato to order uh, five more copies, but I think the best way for you, um, and I do think that in this time of uh, crisis and confusion, 
I firmly believe each household should have a copy, and each member of the household should read this book, because uh, we are not anymore in the 50s, in the time where we could be satisfied with doing holy hour here and there, and doing the rosary here and there, and uh, reading a chapter of the Bible after every confession or so. Uh, that's not enough anymore. There is an obligation, a moral obligation, for Catholics today to know about what's going on and the errors, the modern errors. Uh, because those modern errors are sometimes subtle and they are uh, hidden sometimes in uh, a cover of tradition, so called. So it's exactly what St. Pius X said about modernist books. One page you read, oh my God, this is really traditional. And you turn the other page and you have the submarine trying to torpedo the Catholic ship. Okay, it's very subtle. But in this book, this book uh, represents, in fact, you know, a summary of all the other books that will have been written against the modern era. So that's why uh, you need to know these things. You need, you absolutely need to know these things. Uh, because uh, with the confusion of today, even the good priests may forget about these things. Maybe they have not read that book. Uh, I will make a confession. I had not read it too until these troubles started. But let me give you a few of the teachings that you can find in the book. It's just a few. But you will see how much uh, they really uh, explain and how much they can give you peace of mind by knowing the truth. Truth comes with, uh, the peace comes with the truth. So I will go uh, a bit quickly. So okay, I took some quotes from different parts. Uh, one here about the revolution. Can it be said that Vatican II was a revolution in the church. Answer, some of its own defenders themselves proclaimed loud and clear that the council was a revolution in the church. For instance, Cardinal Suenens, he was from Belgium, made a parallel between the council and the French Revolution. I hope you know about the French Revolution. That's when they, they killed the kings and uh, persecuted the church in the name of liberty, equality, fraternity. It was a great, that's what brought about the great change in our societies. Um, they said that Vatican II, he said, Vatican II was 789, that's the date of the French Revolution. Vatican II was 789, 1789 in the church. Cardinal Suenens. So we had our French Revolution in the church. F uh, Father Yves Congar, a conciliar theologian, one who has influenced a lot the different texts that we find now in Vatican II. What did he say? He compared the council to the Bolshevik revolution, the communist revolution in Russia, which happened in October 1917. He says, quote, the church has peacefully undergone its October revolution. Those are uh, main actors in the council, but there's many more quotes, but I'm, I'm going faster. So we are going to see three uh, of these errors of the council. Uh, one of them is collegiality. 
The principle of episcopal collegiality rises in opposition to the exercise of authority. The Pope and the bishops must no longer use their power, but they must direct the church collegially or collectively. The idea of equality propagated by the French Revolution has been imposed. It is based upon the false notion of Rousseau. Rousseau is a very bad uh, French philosopher uh, who had very bad ideas and he paved the way to the French Revolution. Rousseau, which denied the existence of an authority willed by God and attributed all power to the people. This theory is contrary to the teaching of the Holy Scripture, as said St. Paul in the Romans chapter 13. Quote, let every soul be subject to our powers, for there is no power but from God, and those that are are ordained of God. So you have that first era where the Pope is not anymore the supreme power and the bishop in their own diocese are not anymore the supreme power. That now they have to consult with everybody. They have to have the agreement. Uh, and one thing that we find in all the, the council is the spirit of progress in the modern world, that we have to basically conform to the modern world. So we read in section 12 on the chapter government space, quote, according to the almost unanimous opinion of believers and unbelievers alike, all things on earth should be related to man as their center and crown. That's a text of the Quran. I don't think we can. There is no way to interpret that in a traditional manner. This is clearly against God. And so therefore Christians are exhorted to work with all men in the building of a more human world. This is exact communist theory to build a paradise on earth. In the final analysis, what, can, what judgment can be made of this document? Cardinal Joseph Ratzenga, when he was a cardinal, called this document a counter syllabus. Why, what does that mean? Uh, that refers to uh, a document uh, of Pope Pius IX called the syllabus. That means a collection. A syllabus of modern errors. So, Pope Pius IX collected the modern errors that were spread in his days, in 1850s already, and analyzed them and condemned them. And now Cardinal Ratzinger said that this document of Vatican II, Gaudium and Spes, is a counter syllabus. And, and that's true, he, he was right. This Vatican II document, in effect, positively affirms what Pius IX denied and condemned. In the Catalog of Contemporary Errors, he established in 1864. Second question, did Cardinal Ratzinger explain why he described Gaudium et Spes as a counter syllabus? The Cardinal justified his analogy by explaining that in the 1960s, the church appropriated, that means made her own, quote, the best values of two centuries of liberal culture. Values which he said, quote, originate outside the church, unquote. But now they have found a place within it. A counter syllabus. What had been condemned by Pius IX has been now uh, integrated 
in the church. What about religious liberty? So in the preceding pages of the book, they explain what it is and uh, who condemned it, how many popes uh, condemned it. There was four waves, four moments, four different historical moments where they tried to come back against the church and try to influence the church. And the popes always condemned them every time. So the next question was, does the religious liberty proclaimed by Vatican II incur these condemnations of the preceding popes of liberal Catholicism? The relig answer, the religious liberty taught by Vatican II incurs several of these condemnations. In Quanta Cura, little problem. In Quanta Cura, for example, Blessed Pius IX condemned, quote, that erroneous opinion, most fatal in its effects on the Catholic Church and the salvation of souls, called by our predecessor Gregory XVI an insanity, namely that liberty of conscience and worship is each man's personal right which ought to be legally proclaimed and asserted in every rightly constituted society. He equally condemned the following error as contrary to the scripture, contrary to the church, contrary to the, the, the Holy Fathers. Quote, that is the best condition of civil society in which no duty is recognized as attached to the civil power of restraining by enacted penalties offenders against the Catholic religion, except so far as public peace may require. So this is contrary to the true doctrine on uh, religious freedom that the church has. The church says you cannot force somebody to convert. Conversion has to be free. But error does not have any rights in civil societies. The rulers of the civil society have a duty to protect the Catholic Church, to protect the truth, and to limit it as far as they can, without creating a civil disturbance, to limit the exercise of error. Why? Because and, and you see that with all those uh, Jehovah Witnesses and everybody who knocks at your door, you know, and asking you if you are saved and these kind of things. No. Uh, unfortunately, there's many people who will listen to these, to these uh, false uh, teachers, teachers of false doctrine. That's why normally in a Catholic society, they should uh, be uh, restricted in the exercise of propagating their errors because if you don't have the Catholic faith, you cannot be saved. And this is the big difference with the modern church today. Because today, they say that you can be saved outside. That, that's, that's basically a, uh, the main... Uh, uh, that summarizes the Council of Vatican II. Now, what about so a quote here about Pope Pius XII? He said, the quote, the Catholic Church, as we have already said, is a perfect society and has its foundation, as its foundation, the truth of faith infallibly revealed by God. For this reason, that which is opposed to the truth is necessarily an error. And the same rights which are objectively recognized for truth, cannot be afforded to error. Otherwise, you put the two on the same foot.
Do the authors of Dignitatis Humanae, the document of the religious liberty, do the authors of this document admit that their con document contradicts the teachings of previous popes? Several of the authors of Dignitatis Humanae were obliged to admit that the text posed some difficulties. The chief inspirer of the text, Father John Courtney Murray, an American, acknowledged this in his commentary, quote, Almost exactly a century later, so remember that the syllabus came 1864 and the, the council a uh, hundred years later, the Declaration on Religious Freedom seems to affirm as a Catholic teaching that which Gregory the Sixteenth and Pius the Ninth held as an insanity, as a mad idea. So now the Council teaches that which was condemned. Father Yves Congar admitted, quote, it cannot be denied that the Declaration on Religious Liberty does say materially something else than the syllabus of 1864. It even says just about the opposite of Propositions 15 and 17 to 79 of this document. Ecumenism. So we know all about ecumenism. ACC 3, ACC 2, ACC 1, the visits to the synagogues, the visit uh, in 2006 to the mosque of Istanbul where the Pope took his shoes off and, and bowed and prayed towards uh, Mecca. So we don't know if he prayed or if he just remained silent, but he, it looks like he was praying. Probably he was not. I hope he was not praying. Uh, but to the onlookers, it looked as if he was praying in a mosque. Uh, and so forth, so on. There's so many things. So, ecumenism, that means that, yes, uh, we have to be, you know, we have to recognize that outside of the church, uh, basically, there are other structures, other religions, and they each have some element of truth, and therefore, you can be saved. If you are a good Muslim, if you are a good Jew, uh, if you are a good atheist, if you are sincere in being an atheist, and as long as you are a human being, uh, because Christ was a human being, now you could be saved. How, and so, how did Pius XI judge these ecumenical activities, which in his days were not as bad as today? Imagine what he would say today. Quote, now such efforts can meet with no kind of approval among Catholics. They presuppose the erroneous view that all religions are more or less good and praiseworthy inasmuch as all give expression under various forms to that innate sense which leads men to God and to the obedient acknowledgement of his rule. Those who hold such a view are not only in error, they distort the true idea of religion and thus reject it, falling gradually into naturalism and atheism. That's where it leads. Because finally, you have to be logical. If all religions can save, then no religion is true. Because they have the idea of God, the philosophical idea of God, as even a Greek philosopher Aristotle understood this, the idea of God implies that there can be only one. Because the idea of God is that he is the supreme being and he is the first cause of everything. And therefore, there cannot be another cause beside. How does the Pope conclude? I hope they would have read that in the Council. Quote, to favor this opinion, therefore, and to encourage such undertakings is tantamount to abandoning the religion revealed by God.
So, so I gave you a few quotes to show you that these documents on collegiality, ecumenism, religious liberty, uh, and also adaptation to the modern world, those are erroneous in themselves. They are not only ambiguous. Ambiguous means, well, you could interpret it in a progressive way or you could interpret it in a traditional way. Uh, and so here a question, should all the Vatican II documents be rejected? Answer, the documents of Vatican II can be divided in three groups. See, so we don't reject all of it. Some are acceptable because they are in conformity with Catholic doctrine, as for example, the decree on the formation of priests. I read it, that's not a bad document. So we can accept a few, maybe one or two, but anyways. Second group, others are equivocal, ambiguous. So that's the ones I told you. They could be interpreted one way or the other. So there's lots of that in the, 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 the Vatican II. Third group, some cannot be understood in an orthodox way, that is to say in the correct Catholic way, in their present formulation. They are unacceptable. That is the case for the Declaration on Religious Liberty. It's very clear. We cannot accept this document. This is not an equivocal document. This is an ambiguous document. This is an erroneous, plain and simple document. The text of the third group, the one group of really bad documents like religious liberty, communism and all that, those that I talked to you about, the text of the third group cannot be accepted until they have been rectified. So if the Pope were to tell us, uh, okay, um, let's interpret Vatican II, the documents of Vatican II, let's interpret it in the light of tradition. We could say, well, those in the second group, okay. But they are four of them that we cannot accept unless they are corrected. So to say that we could interpret the council in the light of tradition is an error if we don't make that distinction between group number two and group number three. What about Tradition, what, what, what do they say? Because uh, they all said that. Uh, Paul VI said, oh, let's interpret in tradition. John Paul II, let's interpret in tradition. Benedict said, let's interpret in tradition. What do they mean by tradition? Now, that's another problem. So, as I said, the first problem is that some of these documents in group three, we cannot even interpret them in tradition. They are erroneous, plain and simple. But the second problem is, what do they mean by tradition? Where does, because they have now the expression living tradition. Uh, where does the expression living tradition used against the traditionalists nowadays come from? The expression living tradition comes from a document of Vatican II. Oh, big surprise. Called Dei Verbum. And it mentions evolving tradition. Oh, so they don't have the same meaning than we do. So, uh, from the modernist viewpoint, the role of the magisterium, that is the teaching of the church, is not to safeguard the deposit of revelation. That's con directly contrary against St. Paul. To transmit what we have received, to safeguard against errors. No, not for them, that's, that's too static. That's not living anymore. For them, tradition is living and his role is to ensure ecclesial communion. Oh. Ecclesial communion in space and time. 
Uh, other question, is this new notion of living tradition to be found in the teaching of Benedict XVI? The notion, answer, the notion of living tradition is omnipresent, is everywhere in Pope Benedict XVI teachings. He explains, tradition, quote, is the communion of the faithful around their legitimate pastors down through history, a communion that the Holy Spirit nurtures, assuring the connection between the experience of the apostolic faith lived in the original community of the disciples and the actual experience of Christ in the church. So tradition is not anymore a teaching. It's an experience. And this is pure Protestantism. Religion is what you feel. Religion is what makes you feel is right, feel is good. You have this experience. So basically for him, tradition is simply uh, a series of uh, experiences. There's another quote. Uh, what is notable in this definition of tradition? Under the pretext of emphasizing the living character of tradition, the essential content of this tradition is left aside. And what is that content? It's the revealed truth which is immutable. So the revealed truth is left aside. And what does he compare tradition to? Quote from Benedict XVI. Tradition is the living river that links us to the origins, the living river in which the origins are ever present. There is that question of flow, of change. Uh, okay, so now we see uh, the different is, there's many more errors, okay? The, you will see, very, that, you can read that, it's like a novel. You know, you read that, it's hard to put it down, okay? They talk to you about all the other changes, and uh, for, they, for example, the, the change they made in the book of exorcisms. The, the, the old father, Amor, who is the chief exorcist of the Diocese of Rome, says, the new ritual of exorcism doesn't work. We tried it. They cannot anymore expel the devil with this new ritual. So they are disobeying Rome, disobeying Rome, and they use the old. Because we, with the old, they expel the devils. With the new, they can't. Because they took the good prayers away. Why would you do that? Why would you make that new form of exorcism and especially make it in such a way that it doesn't work? There has to be a purpose. There has to be a reason. So, uh, question. Wouldn't it have been possible to continue to go along with Rome? Answer. Simple common sense shows and experience confirms that it is currently impossible to fully live and defend the Catholic faith while being approved by conciliar Rome. Following upon the Episcopal Consecration of 1998, 1988, Rome considered the celebration of the former liturgy to a few communities. But in return, they were obliged to recognize the new Mass and to refrain from any criticism of Vatican II. Other question. Uh, we had a victory in 1988 because tradition survived. You remember it was called the Operation Survival. If the victory was, was won, because we say we had that victory in 88, what prevents the society 
from being reconciled with the Roman authorities today? Answer. The consecration of 1988 contributed to saving Catholic tradition, not only by assuring the transmission of the sacrament of holy orders, and thus of the traditional mass and sacraments, but also by protecting a small part of the church's flock against the conciliar errors. Now these conciliar errors continue to ravage the church and they reign even at Rome. To continue to be protected against them effectively, it is therefore necessary to keep a distance from the Roman authorities. The definitive victory is yet to come. So, the purpose of staying away is that now I repeat these conciliar errors continue to ravage the church and they reign even at Rome to continue to be protected against them effectively it is therefore necessary to keep a distance from the Roman authorities it's in this book recommended by His Excellency Bishop Feli Other question, wouldn't it be possible to continue resisting the conciliar errors without being outside the normal chain of command of legitimate church authorities? Wouldn't that be possible? Maybe we could be recognized and maybe we could continue to fight errors. What's the answer the Society of St. Pius X gives to that question? Quote, during an epidemic, the most basic prudence imposes the strict separation of the sick from the healthy. The same holds for the situation today. It is impossible to frequent the conciliar authorities on a regular basis without exposing oneself to contracting their errors. The example of the Ecclesia Dei communities furnishes the striking proof. We cannot have a frequent contact with the conciliar authorities as they are now because they are not converted and because they continue to promote the council. We cannot engage in frequent uh, contact without catching the errors. And it is true, and here uh, you get the book and you will see all the, uh, they name all the communities that uh, were recognized and that finally failed. So I give you only one example, a striking one example. After right after actually we think it was almost the same day because uh, Father Gerard, I know him, I was there at the time. He came to Econ for the consecration and, he, and um, when it was over he left and he signed with Rome. In July 88, Le Barou, Le Barou that's the name of the monastery, I know I, I saw it being built traditional monastery, we were so proud of these guys. Up in the mountain, Mount Ventu. I went there, it was called, they built it, and everybody supported them. There were uh, big donations and people coming every year to help them build, giving their times for free and so forth and so on. And then in 88, he went to sign with Rome, and, but he didn't sign anything. Uh, see, look at that. Le Barou publicly imposed a condition. They said to Rome, we will sign, but, quote, the condition is that no doctrinal 
or liturgical counterpart be required of us and that silence not be imposed on our anti-modernist preaching. You will not oblige us to accept these errors of the Council. You will not oblige us to accept the new Mass or see the new Mass. And you will not oblige us to stop to preach. Uh, you will not oblige us to, yeah, to stop to preach against those errors. Rome says, no problem. Hey, wow, that's great. No problem. That was in July. But by the following October, one monk has observed, quote, a certain relativizing of the critique of the document on religious liberty and a critique of uh, the meeting of Assisi within the Abbey. In fact, Le Barou was even to go so far as to try to justify the errors of Vatican II publicly. In the bottom of the page, there's a quote. There's a monk who wrote a book of 2,960 pages trying to show that those documents of Vatican II could be interpreted in tradition. 3,000 pages to show that. But another monk studied his, uh, his book and he saw that in fact, this book radically falsified the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas on law. Le Barou. They got all the arguments, they got all the conditions. And moreover, uh, in 1995, seven years after he got all those uh, agreements, he can celebrated the new mass with the Pope. Bishop Rifan also can celebrated the new mass. Bishop Rifan on, on campus. Uh, the Fraternity of St. Peter, they have to accept the principle of can celebrating the new mass with the Bishop of the Diocese on, on uh, Monday, Thursday. But surely the Ecclesia de Communities, at least they gain a wider kind of field of apostolate. Maybe now that they have been recognized, maybe they can work more for tradition. Answer. The situation varies quite a bit from country to country and in France from diocese to diocese. But most of the bishops restrict the activities of the Ecclesia de Communities. Even those bishops who are not too hostile towards them hesitate to welcome them since they fear the reactions of their clergy, clergy and their activist laity. Rome, for its part, fears the reactions of the bishop. That's again a uh, collegiality. They are not masters anymore. They, they need to have the consensus. You see how that era of Vatican II does not even enable a conservative bishop to give, to give full liberty to those communities. Finally, what does this situation reveal? The situation of the Ecclesia Dei communities, which are gradually being constrained to abandon traditional doctrine, yet which are only accepted in various dioceses with many restrictions, clearly confirms the existence of the state of necessity invoked by Archbishop Lefebvre. Now, now, as then, for those who desire to defend the Catholic faith to the bitter end, it is impossible to place themselves in the hands of authorities who contradict or relativize the Catholic faith. We cannot put ourselves, now as them, that's not me talking, it's not me. You cannot say Father Giroir is against an agreement. I'm just promoting a book from the society. It's, 
It's not me. It's the book of the society which is for sale. And that's in the Angelus catalog today. So I'm just promoting. They should be happy. They should reward me. They should say, Father, you are. we're going to give you 1% of all the uh, profits that come from the sales. You did a marvelous job. I wish all the priests and all the parishes would sell so many of these books. So I'm not talking against an agreement. I'm just reading the question and answer. Let me repeat the last one. Now, as then, like 88, for those who desire to defend the Catholic faith to the bitter end, it is impossible to place themselves in the hands of authorities who contradict or relativize the Catholic faith. It's just logical. So anyway, so that's what this book says. Very good book, as I said. I encourage you to buy it. Um, and I, I will finish here with a quote about Catholic action. Because unfortunately, uh, it seems sometimes that uh, the faithful think that only the priests have to fight. Only the priests have the duty to defend the church and fight against the errors. This is an error in itself. I have an old book I showed it to the, at the men's meeting last week. Thick like this, of quotes from the popes, starting from 1750 up to before the council, okay, 1960. All the popes saying, the faithful have to learn the doctrine, they have to fight against errors, they have to bend together, they have to participate in groups so as to influence the people around them. Because the priests cannot go everywhere. There are many more places when you, the faithful, can go and reach other people around you where I cannot do it. It is a duty that you learn about these errors, not only to be preserved, but also to help in the fight. And that's how our movement started. If you have studied this movement, this Catholic traditional movement, you will see that it is not Archbishop Lefebvre who placed an advertisement in the papers and said, oh, you know what? We are going to open a mass center, traditional mass center, uh, here in Switzerland or whatever. Uh, uh, all those who like it, come. That's not how it worked. He started the seminary. And he started ordaining priests. And he started preaching against these errors. And he taught those priests against these errors. And what happened? He received demands from the faithful. Father, we are a little group here. Uh, we meet to say the rosary. We are against the modern errors. We want the old mass. Send us our priests. Send us some uh, real priests. And the Archbishop would, would send one. It always was like that. Groups of Catholics who had studied these errors and understood that those were errors and started to fight against them and then they collected together and they asked for a priest. That's always how it worked. And it's all it will continue to be. If, God forbid, if, God forbid, we don't know. I'm not a prophet. We have absolutely no, we cannot know. If, God forbid, one day the society repudiates this book. You will have the duty to quit in conscience. But if you have not read it, you will not know why. Saint Paul himself, the great apostle, said even if there is an angel from heaven that would come and teach you anything that is contrary to what I taught you, 
do not receive him. Even if I myself, he said, even if I myself or even an angel would teach the contrary to what I taught you before, don't receive me. That's an error. So the society for 50 years has fought against errors. And this is the summary of the fight. And this is still, uh, we still, the society still sells this book, as I told you. And, but if, suppose, in 10 years, for some kind of uh, confusion or something, somebody from the society comes on this pulpit and says, you know what, finally, uh, religious liberty is not really that bad. In fact, it has a very, very uh, limited set, uh, sense. Okay? So we never really understood this document. Or we could interpret the documents of Vatican II in a traditional manner. That is wrong. So if he comes, you have to tell him, I'm very, so you, you have to be very respectful, I'm, I'm very sorry, Father. Uh, or if it's a bishop, Your Excellency, give the proper title to everybody. Uh, I'm very sorry, but this is wrong. And I know it's wrong because I read it in your book. And, and if necessary, you have to stop. If this preaching continues, you have to stop going because you want to save your souls. And because you don't want to give a hand to modernist authorities. If they convert, if they correct these, those documents, now we are in another circumstance. But if they don't change, uh, here the answer I just told you many times, uh, we would catch their disease. As happened to all these other communities like Le Barou. So let us, my dear friend, uh, reflect on this. And you've got to read this. You've got to read this book. In the Notre Dame of Saragossa.